Greetings. Oh, it's, the microphone's on. All right, let's, uh, let's get started here today. Let's get started. Good to see everyone here today. Good to see everyone as uh, a lot of uh, busy weekend with the uh, Living Nativity. So a lot of people running on E right now, but uh, God is good. A couple things that you need to know. Uh, number one is the, uh, of course, tonight is our last uh, night of the uh, Living drive through Nativity. So um, 6 o'clock till 8.30 is the last one. And uh, listen, I just got to, I got to praise the Lord for everyone who has taken part in this. Uh, it's just been a great, um, great time and a great, uh, a great work by so many people to make this go from behind the scenes to in front of the scenes, putting up the scenes. It's just, uh, just been an awesome time. And uh, you know, it's exciting to see the Lord just using it. Uh, last night there were cars here. We had to finally shut down last night because there were so many cars that... Uh, yeah, so otherwise we would have been, I think we were here till 9 last night, so um, so it was great. It was great, and uh, again, appreciate everybody who is uh, taking part in that. Uh, we are taking it down. We've got to take it down on Thursday, so if anybody's around Thursday during the day, uh, I think Tuesday night or Thursday day, okay? So that's what's going on there. Uh, a couple things for this week. Uh, Monday, there's a, uh, the 6th tea party in honor of our widows and single moms. That's at 530 uh, here at the church. Uh, so that's tomorrow, yeah. December 6th. And then there's the ladies Bible study, Finding Peace in the Storm. That's Monday nights at 7. Uh, Tuesday morning, there's a women's prayer group here at the church at uh, 845. And then we follow that at 10 o'clock. We have a Bible study for men and women. Wednesday night, all of our groups meet here. We have something for the kids in Iwana, something for the teens. Uh, college and career, 18 to 25 or 26, and then, of course, the adult, uh, we meet in here, prayer meeting. Thursday is Addictions Victorious. Saturday, we have Grief Share at 11 o'clock, 13-week uh, program for that. So that's what's happening. Uh, oh, December 12th, it's a Sunday baptism service. So if you're looking to get baptized, you could uh, sign up on the welcome desk for that. And uh, just a few other things. Ladies Fellowship Dinner on the 12th. At 3 o'clock at Frog Rock Country Club, there's a sign up there, Ladies Fellowship Dinner. And then Christmas Eve service is the 24th. We have two services at 6 and 7.30. And on New Year's Eve, we have dinner and a movie. God's Not Dead, uh, which one is it? 14, 15, 4, 4, something like that. God's Not Dead. And uh, so dinner and a movie, we're going to do that, and then followed by our famous white elephant auction. So that's what's happening. I'll tell you more about that as we get closer. Uh, this Saturday night is the Christmas parade, okay? The Christmas parade is going on, so we love to get everybody walking behind the parade. Um, so if you want to join us, that would be great. Uh, we, you know, we'll take off on Liberty Street. If you just walk down Liberty Street from Bellevue Avenue towards the middle school, uh, you could... Uh, You'll see our float there, and just follow it out. We, you know, hand out candy and tracks and all that stuff during the Christmas parade. So it'd be great if you could join us. We look forward to seeing you. You know, bring your dog as long as it's not vicious. They can walk with you, uh, right? And that's it. So that's what's happening. So good to see everyone, like I said. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Don right now. Don, if you would, please. Yes, sir. Okay, let's continue our worship. With heart, the herald angels sing. Please stand with us. Hark the
great singing out there, great singing. Let's continue on with As the Deer. Be with Anthony today as he comes to deliver a message from you. We so desperately need to hear today. All these things we ask and pray in the mighty matchless name of Jesus. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Amen. Okay, today, uh, I know it's the beginning of December. We have the drive through nativity going on. Uh, and most would think this begins the Christmas uh story sermons, but not just yet. We are in uh, 1 Peter, and we're in chapter 4. Uh, we're going to pick up there, uh, 1 Peter 4. We've got one more week of Peter, and then we will uh, get in some Christmas messages. Um, boy, is that me live on that screen up there? That's a scary thing to see as I'm looking at myself. Um, <laughs> Peter... Uh, Peter's been talking uh, up to this point about the life of submission for the Christian and how that plays out into all areas of life. And now he's shifting the topic, uh, and it's the topic that uh, he speaks about a lot. And the topic is about the suffering of a believer. 
Of course, suffering is not a topic that most people like to talk about, but uh, it is a reality in the life of a Christian. Uh, I don't know who J. Vernon McGee was quoting, but I did read where he said, Jesus often spoke of Christianity as a banquet, uh, but never a picnic. Uh, he never said it was going to be easy down here. So in bringing up this difficult topic, Peter is going to point us to Jesus, and that's something that he did with the life of submission. He pointed us to Jesus, and now when he talks about suffering, in 1 Peter 3.18, Peter wrote, For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Notice it says Jesus suffered once for our sins, and he did it for the very reason to bring us to God. Why did he do it? The fact is mankind is separated from God. We have sinned, not only have we sinned, we're born with a sin nature uh, that was passed down to us from Adam, so we are separated from God. But Jesus, in coming to this earth and dying on the cross, would make a way for sinful people like us to be brought into a relationship with God. It was Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. So he is the only way that we can be forgiven of our sins because he paid our price. That's what we're going to be celebrating today at communion, the fact that Jesus gave his body, he bore our sins upon his body and then would pay for our sins on the cross with his own blood. So we're reminded of that at, uh, at communion today. Uh, but that's why he came. It says in Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. And again, he did that by becoming man. And in those 33 years that he walked this earth, he would also suffer. The Bible says all the things that we suffer. He would go through all the things that we go through, and he would enter our pain. Uh, he felt what we feel. He's gone through the same things. Uh, and the Bible tells us because he did, he's able to comfort us because he felt it. He didn't just, he experienced it, he overcame it, and he's able to be here for us in our time of need. You know, think about it. He suffered not just on the cross, but he lived a, a life like we live. Uh, just living on this planet, this fallen earth, uh, you know, he felt and experienced all the things that we experience. Uh, I mean, we're about to, of course, enter, enter the Christmas season here where we sing about Emmanuel, God with us, that God entered humanity as a newborn baby. Did you ever think about that? Uh, I mean, God created Adam, uh, and he was a grown man, okay? Jesus could have come to earth. He could have entered this earth as a grown man, but he chose to come as a baby. Isn't that something? He came as a baby in a manger. Think about that. And in doing that, uh, you know, that was God's plan. He would go through everything that we did. I mean, he experienced uh, the things we experienced. He lived a normal life, okay? I mean, if we look at the last you see of Jesus at 12 years old in the temple when his parents had left him behind, and then all you hear is Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And the next time you pick him up, he's already, you know, 29 years old or so. But in that time, he was learning and he was suffering. You know, he suffered the loss of a parent when he was quite young. He went through the things we go through, all the experiences of life. And God, God made it so that his own son would be of no exception. He lived a life, suffered as he went. So in verse, uh, chapter one, 4, verse 1, it says, For as much then as Christ suffered for us in the flesh, Arm yourself likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Now, this is an interesting verse. Christ suffered in the flesh, talking about him being a human being. He suffered as a human being, and he's saying, now arm ourselves with the same mind. For he that suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. What does that mean? Well, he's saying, as Christ suffered for us, that we should be setting our minds, have the same mindset, the same attitude as Christ had. Listen, again, I stress the fact, Jesus came into a fallen world and would suffer and would, you know, deal with the same stuff we deal with. 
But we have to understand as Christians, we're, we're in a war, okay? We are in a war. And a Christian life is not a pleasure cruise, it is a battle. And the battle is against Satan and his demons. We live in a, in a world system that runs contrary to the way of God. So uh, if you notice anything, you know that the war uh, is won or lost in our minds. Isn't this where it all starts? Right here. And so this is why he's saying, you know, have the same mindset, have the same attitude. Peter's saying this because he knows that sin is destructive and it produces death. Just think about the cross in itself. The cross shows the destructiveness of sin. Not that Jesus ever sinned, but he bore our sin upon himself. So much so that his father turned his eyes from him. As Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God is holy. He cannot look upon the sin that Jesus was carrying, would turn his eyes from him. He was forsaken by God. So we would never have to be forsaken. You see, it shows the, the destructiveness of sin. It shows the injustice of sin, that the sinless one would be put to death by sinners. And it shows the wickedness of Satan, who's only out to steal, kill, and destroy. So Peter's going to say that we need to be vigilant and diligent, okay, because we have a real enemy. Back in chapter 1 and verse 13, he says, therefore gird up the loins of your mind. Again, it's talking about how important, how we think. And then he says in 1 Peter 5, 8, we'll see next week, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Uh, if there was a, you know, somebody told you that a lion was loose in your neighborhood, you wouldn't just be walking out singing do -si do right? You'd be a little bit more uh, vigilant in how you get out to your car that morning, because there's a roaring lion walking about. So again, we have to approach this war with the right mindset. It's the mindset that endures suffering. God never said it was going to be easy, okay? And understand that even in suffering, God has a purpose for it. So Peter tells his readers that. There's a purpose. He told us that in chapter 1 where he says, The trials of our faith is more precious than gold that perishes. In God's school of growing believers, suffering is one of the tools that he uses. We're not exempt from it. And he does it to grow us and to refine us. Okay, uh, He does it to, to mature us so that we could shine as lights in a dark world. So we have to understand that we are not exempt from it either. Paul writes that all who live godly will suffer persecution. Now, face it, we, we've been blessed to live in this nation. Right? Our persecution is not that great, is it? I mean, you know, people call you a holy roller. You know, right? it's, not, it's not too bad, is it? I mean, as a, compared to other nations, we don't know if that'll stay. I hope it does, right? This is great to have this, the freedom to live for Christ. But it may not always be the case, okay? The fact is, the world wants little to do with people who are striving to live godly, uh, that are trying to shine as lights in a dark world. Uh, so the, a godly lifestyle convicts many. People say, I've heard people say, you know, I don't know why I didn't do anything to it. Your light's too bright. If you're trying to live for Jesus and he, you're allowing him to shine through you, your light's too bright. So a lot of times you're going to be either mocked or ridiculed or whatever. So as much as we don't like it, God will use that. He uses these things. He chooses suffering. What are some reasons we suffer? Well, there's a few different reasons. People always ask, why would God allow suffering? Well, one, suffering is used to discipline us. That's what it says, that, you know, the chastisement of God is never pleasant in the beginning, okay? But it does produce the peaceable fruit of righteousness. So if we are choosing to go our own way, do our own thing, sometimes he has to discipline us, okay? And it's not always pleasant. But, again... He says it does produce the peaceable fruit of righteousness. If you're never disciplined, the Bible says, then you're not truly a son of God. Okay? So all of us, if you're a believer here today, should at some point or another have felt the disciplining hand of God. Okay? And also, listen, suffering, since we're all in this place together, in this world together, it helps us to uh, encourage others who are now going through something that you went through. And you so has God comforted you, you can now comfort others. I think here in 1 Peter chapter 4, 
I think he's showing us another reason why uh, about suffering and what it does for us. It says that as Christ suffered in this flesh, arm yourself with the same mind. He that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Suffering has a way of drawing us closer to the Lord, doesn't it? I mean, when things are getting tough, we kind of get closer to the Lord. You know, when things are going well, we give them the, I'm good, and we get about our day and our life. But when things start to get tough, it has a way of us refocusing on the important things, drawing closer to the Lord. And you know what happens as we draw closer to the Lord, the more we're in his word, the more we're in prayer, it has a way of purifying us. Because you know what it does? The word of God, you know, shines a light on our lives and God deals with the things in our lives that are, you know, that need to be dealt with, right? It's just like you've heard me explain it before is a, you know, you could clean a room and it looks beautiful until that the light comes through the window and you're like, man, I just dusted this place, right? You ever have that? Well, same thing with us, that we think we're looking good. All of a sudden, we're in the Word, and we're drawing closer to the Lord. And listen, and I've heard it said before that we may actually feel worse. People say, wait, I'm drawing close to the Lord. I feel worse because God exposes these things, okay? But he never does it to rub our nose in it, okay? Body, but the Bible says, we talked about it Wednesday night, that you know what? He pities us as a father pities his children. He knows we're but dust. He knows that, you know, we're messed up. But he reveals these things to us to help us, to rid these things from us. That's what he does it for. He's not doing it to defeat us. He's doing it to, to change us, transform us into the image of Jesus Christ, right? So, again, sometimes you draw near and you feel worse because, man, I thought I, I, thought I was better than this. And you start to realize, I'm not too good, am I? <laughs> but that's okay because he's good. And I, listen, it just shows how, how amazing his grace is, doesn't it? And say, so we draw closer to the Lord. Natural thing that happens as we draw closer to the Lord, we become more conscious of how we're living, more convicted of our sin. And it reminds us that, guess what? This, this world is temporary. It reminds us of the frailty of life, that we only have so much time. So Peter's going to say this, how we spend our time uh, you know, should really be determined by, you know, living for the Lord. Look at verse 2, that we no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Peter's big on this. We only have so much time. I, I, I brought this up here to illustrate this. This is called an hourglass. Now, this is not how long I'm preaching today, but this is an hourglass, okay? So let me put it right here. What was it, the days of our lives? What did they say? Yeah. Sands in the hourglass. So are the days of our lives. Goes by quick, doesn't it? Yeah, isn't it funny when you were younger? I mean, can you imagine it's, it's going to be Christmas already, a couple weeks, and then it's going to be gone. And do you remember as a kid when Christmas passed, it was like, oh, i got to wait a whole year, right? <laughs> And then you'd get that little relief like in August, the Sears catalog would come in. Do you remember that? Yes! You younger people don't remember the Sears catalog, do you? <laughs> that, was the, that was it, man. Christmas is right around the corner. Here it is. I got the catalog. Let me start circling all the things that I want, right? Well, now it seems like Christmas is done and it's here again. Isn't that something as you get older, how time just snaps along like the sands in that hourglass. It just runs through. So Peter's saying, listen, knowing these things, knowing how fast time moves along, we should no longer live the rest of our time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. You see, the one who suffers will on this earth all of a sudden be more interested in the will of God. God, what is it that you're teaching me? What is it that you're trying to show me here? You see, Peter says, listen, for in time past, our life may suffice to us to have wrought in the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. He says, you already spent enough time in the previous life running with the world, running with the things that the world does. For anybody here who was saved later in life, you know you have some time in, in the world, right? And he's saying, this is what it was like. 
describes the works of the flesh. This is not an exhaustive list because if, if it were, we'd say, well, I'm good. I don't do any of those things. This is just some of the things that Peter's saying, the works of the flesh, lasciviousness. It's, it means filthiness. It means indecency, okay? It means, I mean, if you look at our world now, it means shamelessness. I mean, we live in a time where anything goes, right? Anything goes. It's crazy. So it says lasciviousness was part of that. Lusts. It's an out-of-control desire. Excess of wine means excessive amount of wines. Drunkenness. Throw drugs in there. Okay? Anything taking us out of our mind. Revelings. Wild parties. Drinking parties or orgies. How about that? That uh, this is what they were doing. Banquetings. I first read that. I said, wait a minute. I can't go to Shady Maple anymore, but that's not what it means. <laughs> not that kind of banquet. It means... Uh, it means Drinking matches to see who could drink the most. How about that? And abominable idolatries. That's giving over, you know, our primary devotion, our time and energy to something other than God. Or basically, when God and whatever that thing is come head to head, who wins? That could be work. That could be play. It could be wanting to just do your own thing. When God and that thing comes head to head, who wins? That becomes an idol. Sometimes self is an idol. As we know, in the end times, it says men will be lovers of self more than lovers of God. So there's a problem. He says, you used to run like that. Don't run like that anymore, okay? Instead, you want to run for the will of God. Face it. Most of the people who come to the Lord, if they ran with the world, you know what they found? Those things that the world says you need, those things that are going to fulfill you, just leave you empty, right? Many people have come to the Lord because they've done all those things, and they're saying there's still something missing. You see, God has placed, a, as we like to call it, the God spot in our heart. And you know what? Everything that comes in from, that the world wants to offer keeps going out of that same, that hole. Only God can fill that hole. That's why it says, blessed is he who seeks, or, you know, searches after righteousness. They shall be filled. When you start seeking after the Lord and you start to see that, you know, he meets your desires. Just like we sung the song, right? As the deer pants for the water. When you start to understand and, and you develop a relationship with the Lord, you find fulfillment. So Peter's saying, listen, once you've done that, don't go back to the, your old way of living anymore. You know, he's, uh, Proverbs 26, 11 says, as a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool to his folly. Right? You ever see your dog pukes and then all of a sudden goes back and eats it? That's a nice sight, isn't it? Was that too graphic? What, was it puke or eating it? But that's what it says. I'm just saying what the Bible says. As the dog returns to his vomit, so a fool to, returns to his folly. You know, the dog goes back and you're saying, no, don't eat that thing. Give me a kiss. No, so, you know, it's always a nice thing. Eh? <laughs> kiss. Yeah. Anyway, he's saying that's what it's like. That's what it's like if we go back to our previous life. Don't do it. It stinks. God has so much more for us. We're different now. Remember Peter earlier said, be holy as he is holy. So be different. Okay? When we finally grasp that God has delivered us from our past, these former lusts of our past, and begin living for the Lord, it's going to have an effect on those we used to party with. Right? Did anybody have, a, a, you know, you saw a difference with the people you used to hang with? Yeah, it's just the way it is. Look what it says in verse 4. Wherein they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you. You know, all of a sudden you start telling your friends, I don't want to do that anymore. That's not my thing, right? I don't want to do it. They start thinking it's strange. They can't believe it. Wait a minute. You were, you were the party guy. Now what happened to you, right? Uh, you know what they always like to tell you? You'll be back. Anybody hear that when they got saved? You'll be back. I remember when I got saved. It was a dramatic save. <laughs> it really was. And the people saying, you'll be back. I said, I ain't coming back. I'm not coming back. And praise the Lord, I haven't. All right? I haven't, I haven't gone back. You know, it, because there's nothing back there. Nothing back there. What we have in the Lord is so much better than anything that the world could offer. So what do they do? They begin to persecute you. First, uh, you'll be back. Then all of a sudden, they start, you know, 
not only do they start making fun of you, then they stop inviting you, right? Don't you feel you, you, know, you felt left out in the beginning? They don't invite me anymore. Now you're like, well, now at least I don't have to say no. Just different. We're different than the world. So Peter says, look what he says in verse 5 then. After he says, they begin to persecute you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? As believers, we know that one day the unbelievers who ran with the world, who were living in the flesh, will, who persecuted the believers, will one day stand before God in his judgment. We know that. So look what he says. This is an interesting thing. He doesn't say, good for them. They deserve it. Instead, he says, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. For this cause, the gospel was preached. For what cause? Because of the coming judgment, the gospel was preached. <laughs> Folks, that was us. Do you understand that? We were there. We were on the road that was leading to destruction. But somebody came through into our lives and preached the gospel to us that we could be forgiven of our sins and given this free gift of everlasting life, and it's all because of the grace of God, that none of us deserve it, but God in his love would do that for us. He says, that was us. You see, we have to understand something. We were, we were delivered from so great a death. We were redeemed. So he's saying, listen, we got to remember, God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. That's what the Bible says, but that they would turn. And when you turn, instead, live in the Spirit. Be different than the world. Now he says this in verse 7, But the end of all things is at hand. Be sober and watch unto prayer. But the end of all things is at hand. Now this saying, the end of all things is at hand, has been true since the Lord Jesus went back to heaven. So it's been almost 2,000 years. So what does that mean? Well, we believe in the imminent return of Christ, that he could return at any moment and doesn't need any notice, okay? We do know that if the birth pangs that Jesus teaches, like in Matthew 24, are, are there, then it becomes more evident of his return. And if, let me tell you something. If we look around the world and the things going around our world right now, I would say we are close. I know one thing. We are closer now than when we first believed, Right? There's no doubt about it. We're closer now than last week. And if you really look at the things going on in our world, man, we should be looking and saying, man, it is getting close. It's getting close. So because the end of all things are at hand, verse 7, look what he says. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. So what does it mean, be sober? It means be serious-minded. Balance all things out with eternity in mind. Because there's only so much time. There's only so much time. We, we need to understand that. Listen, for you younger folks here, a lot of younger folks think, well, I don't have to serve the Lord till later. I got time. Listen, nobody knows that time, right? Just the way it is. Matter of fact, we only have so many, we only have so many years in our lives. The Lord knows how many years we have. Are we investing in those things that are eternal? That's the thing we have to understand. Don't wait till later. I remember, you know, I wasn't raised to know about investments and stuff like that. You know, you invest, you never see those, uh, I don't even know the words for it. Amortization, what's that word? Is that it? Did I say the right word? How about that? Okay, so that, you know, you save a little bit here and then when you get old, you got this much, you ever see those things? Well, one, whoever thought about getting old, right? We didn't think about getting old. We gotta burn it, baby. That's how it was. That was, that was my lifestyle beforehand, by the way. We got to burn it. Let's do it. Well, now as you get older, man, don't you wish you saved? Don't you wish you knew those things? See, I had my first Dave Ramsey course on finances. I was 53 years old. And, you know, that would start saying, well, if you would have saved this back then, you would have had this right now. You know what I got from my, I did it, I was 53. You know what I got out of my first Dave Ramsey course? Black and blue posterior because I was kicking myself. Why didn't I do that, right? Well, same thing with our eternal bank account. Listen, for you younger folks, run for the Lord. Serve him. And you will store up things for you for eternity. For you people who got saved later in life, run for the Lord. Run for the Lord. It's time to live for the Lord. So he says, be sober. Be, be, 
intelligent, live with eternity in mind. Take things seriously. Take life seriously. That doesn't mean everything's got to be serious and there's no fun. There, of course, there's great fun. I never had so much fun until I got saved, tell you the truth. Okay? But we have to understand our time is limited here. This is what Peter keeps stressing. Our time is limited here, so make the most of it. So how are we to live under the climax of history? How are we to live? Well, he says watch and pray. Watch means to be alert of what's going on around us. Be alert. Listen, these days are evil. We need to guard our minds. I'm going to tell you something. They are trying to instill fear in us. If you haven't understood that yet, wake up, all right? Because they're trying to instill fear in us. Now, it's okay to be cautious, but to be fearful is wrong for the Christian. Because we know God is sovereign. He's in control. So don't buy into the fear. I'm going to tell you something. Uh, and we've been saying it. There's going to be variant after variant after variant. Just the way it is. We, got to, we can't allow fear to overtake us. Because if anything, listen, we know where we're going. I was talking to the pastor the other night. You know, he said to me, I've never seen Christians so afraid of dying as I do now. We know where we're going. And I'm not saying we want to rush to get there. But we shouldn't be afraid. So we can't allow all this, con we're being barraged with things to make us afraid. We're the ones who have to stand out. Remember where they ask, what is this hope that lies in you? What is this hope you have? We need to guard our minds against how they, and when I say they, the, the spiritual powers that be that want to control this world, how they want to divide and conquer us. Whether it's through political lines or racial lines, we can't buy into that. So we need to be wise to the wiles of the devil. And he says, pray. Pray. Listen, we pray every Wednesday night. We meet here to pray. We pray for the church. We pray for believers. We pray for unbelievers. We pray for this nation. Believers are told to pray. Still, we don't see the need to join together to pray. And I talked about the importance of corporate prayer how it knits our hearts together. The early church, they met every day and prayed. Listen, I just think that it's important. I, I, for some reason, I, how bad does it have to get before the church understands, you know what, maybe I'll come out and pray. Listen, you don't even, here's the good thing. Remember you had the program of VCR? That took like uh, some kind of degree, didn't it? Programming your VCR. Now they have streaming. Now you just have, you could just, Click on it, and it'll record every Jeopardy episode you want. So you won't even miss Jeopardy if you come on Wednesday night. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Is it important to pray? It's important to pray. I, I'm going to keep encouraging us to pray. How do we live under the climax of history? He says pray. Verse 8 says, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover a multitude of sins. Fervent charity. I like it. it, it it's actually talking about athleticism. It's talking about an athlete who's straining, who's reaching out and straining as he's running a race. He's saying that kind of fervency, have that kind of charity, uh, fervent charity in your walk. Fervent charity. Of course, charity is agape love, unconditional love. Love one another fervently. Well, face it, some people are easier to love than others, right? Anybody ever have that? Not here, of course, but I'm sure there's people out there that you just say, Man, I got a tough time loving you, right? And there's others you just say, I can't stop loving you. I've made up my mind, right? Just the way it is. So listen, fervent charity as Christians were to love one another. Fervent charity is more than just human warm feelings, okay? It's a love that goes the extra mile. And notice that kind of love covers a multitude of sins. Now, what does Peter mean by that? Well, he's, he's citing Proverbs 10, 12. Hate stirreth up, uh, hatred stirreth up strifes, but love covers all sins. Listen to what Warren Wiersbe says. Love does not condone sin, for if we love somebody, we'll be grieved to see him sin and hurt himself and others. Rather, love covers sin in that love motivates us to hide the sin from others and not spread it abroad. 
You know what that's saying? If you see somebody in sin, you don't go tell Joe Schmo about it. You go to the, your, the brother who's sinning, the sister who's sinning, and say, listen, you're caring for them. That's what he's saying is that kind of love. It's not letting them just live their life. It's saying, listen, you're, you're, you're hurting yourself. You're hurting others. That's what it's saying. Okay? Listen, and don't spread it abroad. Listen, aren't, aren't you thankful that God doesn't spread our sin abroad? Can you imagine that? That the one who knows everything about us, that he doesn't say, hey, here, let me, let me expose Anthony Parisi. Boy, wouldn't that be something? Word, thought, and deed? Hello. You see? Fervent char uh, charity, as I like to say, it cuts everybody some slack. Isn't it nice? Don't we need to cut some slack for people? Wouldn't it be nice to give people the benefit of the doubt? You know, you see somebody someday and they didn't say hello to you. Oh, what's wrong with them? Well, maybe they just had a tough morning, right? Maybe their hair didn't just sit right. Who knows? <laughs> cut each other some slack. I'm telling you right now, we're living in a time where we're all trying to figure things out, right? It's tough times. How do we live under the climax of history? He says, use hospitality one to another without grudging. Use hospitality. Open your house up. That used to be the days. Remember that? Do you remember when people could stop over without announcing? Do you remember that? There was always something there at your house. People could stop over. It was nice, wasn't it? It's a different world now. It is. Somebody comes to your door, it's scary, right? Who's at my door? I had my kids. They call me up. Somebody's at the door. Who is it? I don't know. Well, look outside. I, I got to tell them where to look through a certain window so that, you know. It's a big brown truck. It's called UPS. UPS. <laughs> <laughs> these, this is, these are actual conversations I've had, okay? Just so you know. It's a scary world, though, isn't it? It's a scary world. I don't, listen, I don't blame them. Scary world. But it used to be a time people could stop over. But now we're all so busy, we don't have time for anybody. Got to understand, when Peter was writing this, the believers would open up their homes to one another because they didn't have a church to meet. So they met in homes. You know, this church, when we moved from down the shore to this town, you know where the first services started? In my living room. I wasn't the pastor. I was just a member of the church. Fifteen chairs set up, and nobody, and yes, I got to church late. They couldn't understand that. I was just sleeping in the other room. How are you late for church? <laughs> I'm here, ain't I? Just love me. But that's where we started. You see, their only church, they didn't have buildings. And I'm going to tell you something right now. You never know. If they push, you know, later on that, oh, we got to close again and this and that, we may be meeting in homes again. You don't know. This world is crazy going right now. I hope it doesn't happen, but we've got to prepare for the worst. Peter's writing to believers who are being persecuted. They're fleeing to other cities. They have nothing. Open up your home, he's saying. And don't do it grudgingly. You know what that means? You know, oh, they're coming over. Ah, you know. Isn't that nice when they do it grudgingly? How do we live under this climax of history? Look at verse 10. As every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards to the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister or serve, let him do so of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things might be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. What is he saying here? Now, listen, if God has led you here and you're being fed and you believe this is where the Lord wants you, then begin serving. It's Jesus who builds his church. He knows the needs of this church. He knows the needs of the next church and the next church. So you know what he's saying? God places you in a place, use your gifts and use your ability to serve the Lord as you serve others. So let me ask you, are you seeking out opportunities to serve? That's something we've got to ask us. Let me tell you something. You know what was exciting? It was exciting. When I saw this line of cars last night, that was exciting to me, that people were coming and they were going to get the gospel. But you know what else was exciting? See how many people were serving in this ministry. That was awesome to see so many people there last night, either acting or in behind the scenes or whatever. But that's, that's encouraging to me. Boy, that, the, I, I, I left here last night, I'm telling you right now, between the, the line of cars and all the people, I was doing the holy dance last night. I was, I was. I was just praising God for how awesome it was. You see? 
I believe that a lot of times people that, that, you know, a lot of times people don't want to serve because, oh, I don't know my spiritual gift or I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Well, do something. You know, God's not going to be angry if you do something, right? I, I've heard people say, well, I don't want to serve here. If God doesn't want it, he may get angry. God is not going to get angry if you begin serving him, okay? That, I always liken it to if I tell my kids to, you know, clean their room and they come out and say, can I do the living room too? <laughs> right? After I get up off the floor from, from such a request, I'm not going to get angry if they want to sweep the living room. I'll do the holy dance, right? God is just happy. Listen, serve. If you don't know what your gift is, I'll tell you what you do. You start serving, and you know what happens over time? You naturally begin to slide into those areas that you know is just right for you. But do something, and everybody can do something. Everybody can do something. Paul says that, you know, God is equipping his church in Ephesians 4 so that we come up into the measure of the fullness of stature of Christ, that when everyone, everyone is utilizing their gifts and their abilities and, and building the church, the body grows, and what happens? People will look at that church and they see Jesus. That is, that's what our desire should be. That's what every church's desire should be, that when, when people come here, they see Jesus in this place. They see the hands and feet of Jesus ministering and serving. But that only happens when each of us do our part. Listen, Christ is at work in the church today. And he's making known the, the message of the gospel, the transforming power of the grace of God. So the world needs to see a church, and none of us are meant to go it alone. Well, that's, that's, that's not the way it is. When we're representing Christ, we each have a part. Isn't that amazing that we each have a part? We do. God has a part for you. So let me just say this. Where do you, it says be good stewards. We're to be good overseers. We're to be taking care of the manifold graces of God. That's what he says. So I'll just tell you this. If you put yourself on the bench or you just retired because you did your time, and that one gets me, so don't tell me that ever. I'm going to tell you. Don't tell me that I might because this is what I'm thinking. When people say, I've done my time, what that tells me is their service to Jesus was like a prison sentence. I've done my time. I had a guy tell me that one time. I said, aren't you active in your church? Oh, I left that church. I go to a big church now, 5,000 people. I go in, I sit there, hear the service, and I leave. I did my time. That's what he told me. Then he asked me, he says, are you busy in your church? What do you do? I said, I'm the pastor. He went, oh, oh. <laughs> Wrong, wrong, thing to, wrong thing to tell the pastor. That one grates me. That gets me. I don't know. Listen, now's not the, the time to retire. It says the end of all things are at hand. You know what it is? It's time to refire. We've got to refire. Listen, we've got to be involved. The fact is this. As the church, as the pastor telling you about there, we need you. We need you. That's just the way it is. We need you. He says we're to be good stewards or good caretakers of the manifold grace of God. So when we minister in some capacity, we, we're to be conduits of his grace. That is, he is, has given grace to us. That is to flow through us out to other people. That's, that's the simple thing. You say we're to be conduits of that grace. So let me ask you this. Have you received God's grace? The answer is yes. Don't show so much excitement about that, but the answer is yes. Listen, if you're here today and you're alive, you, you have God's grace today, right? If, if you've been forgiven because you've trusted Christ, that's a gift of God's grace, right? right, right. Exactly. You know what it means to be forgiven. That's a gift of God's grace. So what is he saying? Let that flow through you to other people. It's just the way it is. Paul said that knowledge of the love of Christ shown through his death, burial, and resurrection is the thing that compels him to serve the Lord. That thing should be the thing that moves us. And when we're not doing it, basically we're being a bad steward. We're hoarding that grace for ourselves. And God says, listen, we should be serving him, and it should be flowing through us. That's a good motivation to serve the Lord, isn't it? Don't you want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant? 
Sure. God has given us each something to do. If you don't know what that thing is, start doing something. And God will lead you. God hits moving targets. It's a privilege to serve the Lord. And he doesn't forget the labor of love that's done in his name. He'll remember everything that we ever do for his name as we serve one another. Well, that's a good motivation to serve the Lord, isn't it? You need motivation? There's a good motivation. Look what happens when believers do these things. Verse 11, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. God is glorified when we are all good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Listen, sometimes, you're, sometimes that job puts you out front, right? I'm, I'm an out front guy. I'm up here. But you know what? There's a lot of people who do a lot of work behind the scenes. You know, there's nothing. Let me tell you something. And God sees it all. I'm, I'm going to call out these guys, but I think they deserve it. Let me tell you something. Last night we had a great meal. Davis cooked a great meal. You know, Davis, there's Davis right there. Hi, Davis. How you doing? Yeah. Matter of fact, it was so good, I had it again 10 o'clock last night as I got home. That's how good it was. But you know what? Yesterday, while we were doing, you know, during the day, we don't see the preparation before the meal. And here's Davis and Tom, and you know what they were doing yesterday during the day? They were back in the kitchen of the church peeling potatoes. Think about that. Nobody saw that, but God saw that. They were just being faithful to what God gave them to do. And that's really all he's calling us to do is be faithful. Sometimes it's in the front of people, sometimes it's behind the scenes, but it all works together. And that's what we're called to do, to, to, you know, to be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. That's an important thing. Using your gifts and your abilities to do whatever God has called you to do. You know, when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, he says, I did this. He goes, do you know what I've done? The, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Neither is he that sent him greater than he that sent him. You know what he's saying? Listen, we're not greater than Jesus. If Jesus could wash the disciples' feet, then we need to wash one another's feet. We need to serve one another. And here's what he says. If you know these things, that's great, but you know what? Happier are you if you do them. You'll find happiness, you'll find blessedness, you'll find fulfillment by serving in the body of Christ. I'm telling you right now, if you're saying in your Christian life, I'm not fulfilled, uh, 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 you know, I'm missing something, start serving. And you're going to find happiness. It's better to give than receive, right? That's what he says. That's a good motivator, isn't it? Man, I'm looking for happiness. Start serving. And you can find happiness. It's a great thing. Let me tell you something. It's a, it's a great thing. Great motivation. So let's, let's get personal here as I close this in. Bring it to our doorstep. To whom in the church are you being a blessing to? To whom in the church are you being a blessing to? You see, you can't be a blessing if you just come here and then run out. You've got to be invested, right? To whom in the church are you being a blessing? We're to be, you know... Good stewards of the manifold grace of God. God has gifted you. God has given you abilities to use in the body. Who are you being a blessing to? You know, think about the church, the hands and feet of Christ. And if we were to look personally, and if you're sitting there and you say to yourself, okay, if everybody in this church served like I served, what would this church look like? There's some people that serve, man, and they just have that heart to serve. And you know what? The church is blessed by that. If everybody would just do a part, let me tell you something, we would fly. And I think we have a great church, by the way. I think we have an awesome amount of people here. I, I, I do. It excites me to see that. I got a little lifted in my spirit last night when I saw that. It's good stuff. Peter began this section of the letter with these words in verse 7, but the end of all things is at hand, like the sands of the hourglass. Shortness of time remaining for all of us is a good motivation to serve the Lord, isn't it? Again, he says that we should no longer live the rest of our time in the flesh to the lust of men, 
but to the will of God. So listen, whether we, the return of Christ is that we, he takes us home through the rapture, or if it's our death, we should live our lives with a sense of urgency that the return of the Lord is near and should affect the things that we do. Are we diligently serving him by serving in the body so that people see Jesus in this place? If you don't know what to do, where you could fit in, hey, you know what? I'll help you out. And we'll find you a place because there's always something to do. And you know what the outcome is? You'll be a blessing to others and you'll be blessed for doing it. It's as simple as that. We're to be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Before we go into communion, Paul writes that we're to examine ourselves. A lot of times, as I said, we, we've, we, commit our, we confess the sins that we've committed. And that's something that we have to do because we all sin. So we confess our sins of commission, things that we've done. But a lot of times we don't confess our sins of omission. You know, James says, to him who knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. The fact is, again, you've been gifted. You've been given uh, an opportunity to serve. What are you doing with this manifold grace of God? Are you a good steward of that manifold grace? Am I a good steward of the manifold grace of God? Sometimes we don't confess the sins of omission. Lord, I know you're calling me to do this, but the fact is, I'm afraid. Right? Fear is a very real thing, right? Fear is a thing. Fear of failure, fear of not being accepted. You know, fear plays a big part. Sometimes you've got to put fear aside and just trust God. You know, what if I do it and I'm no good? Well, at least you tried, right? Turtle never gets anywhere unless he sticks his neck out. Sometimes you just got to stick your neck out. Sometimes our sin is the sin of omission. Lord, I know you're calling me. I know you're putting this burden on me, but I'm just not doing it. Forgive me. This body could be, you know, as good as it is, could be on fire if everybody would take seriously what Peter's saying here, being good stewards of the manifold grace of God, ministering to the body. So as we go into communion, let's take some time. Does anybody need communion here? Everybody have a communion cup here? Anybody need any? We have up front here, Sam. There's, there's a couple here, a few here. Let's, uh, let's take this time, and just a, a, a quiet time before the Lord. And again, we, here's the good news. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And be honest with the Lord. Lord, I know you're calling me to do this. And, you know, well, I got other plans. Or I want to do this. Or I want to do that. Confess it. And see what God can do to a people who are, you got it over there? To a people who really want to live for him. Again, we spend enough time running with the world. Why don't we spend that time running with the Lord? One of my favorite verses is where Paul says, as you ran from iniquity to iniquity, basically run with that same zeal for the Lord. Anybody run crazy in the world? Yeah, I'm sure you did. <laughs> so did I. That's why I want to run now for Jesus. None of us get it perfect, that's for sure. I've been knocked down a lot of times, but I just keep getting back up. Because I saw Jesus, man, on that road to Calvary, getting falling down, but getting back up. And he did it for us. As we go before him today, why don't we just take that time to just, again, get clean before the Lord, and we'll take a time of communion. Let's go before the Lord.
Paul the Apostle says, I've received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you for this bread, symbolic of the body of Jesus, who suffered for us, who took our sin, who took your wrath, and yet you did it for us. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus giving his body. We ask your blessing on this bread. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Take eat, remembering him. After the same manner, I also took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. Father, again, we thank you for this cup, this juice, symbolic of the blood of Jesus, the blood that cleanses us from all of our sins, that though our sins be as scarlet, you made them white as snow. We thank you for the great salvation that we have in Christ. We ask your blessing on this cup, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Take drink, remembering him. Thank you, Father. You tell us to do communion until you come. I pray that we would all live our lives in the light of eternity, that we would be busy about your business as we see your day approaching, that we would turn from living the lives we did in the past and, and live for the will of God. So help us, Father, by your grace to be good stewards of your manifold grace Help us to, to serve in the body, trusting that you will give us what we need. Faithful are you who called us who also will do it. And Lord, we thank you for this time and the freedom that we have to meet here. We ask your blessing on your people. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight we are meeting. Remember, we'll have uh, dinner first for those in the, uh, in the um, drive-thru. We'll have dinner first, and then we will get started. So around... Uh, 4.30, we're going to meet here, 4.30, 5 o'clock, we'll meet and uh, get ready. So for those here who aren't in it, if you could pray for another good night tonight, that would be great. We would appreciate and cover your prayers, that's for sure, okay? Uh, were these communion cups the hardest communion cups to open in the history of the world? I need a straw. I couldn't get through. <laughs> these are the most hermetically sealed cups that I've had. I don't know if it was just you or me, but... Couldn't do it? Couldn't open it? Couldn't open it. I don't know where we got it, but let's go someplace else because it was, whoo, my cup was crushed because I was trying to open it so bad. Wow. I, I'm glad it wasn't just me. I thought it was getting weak, Don. Uh, you spilled a lot of yours? Wow. It must have been on discount. <laughs> oh, thank you. All right. Let's close out our service with joy to the world, please.